Let's talk about the action part of war. Han Wu Di's period. Han Wu Di is the let me call it, the fourth emperor. Yes, the fourth emperor in line. Okay, and he's quite well known because um okay Wu Wu is actually a posthumous name, a posthumous title. And usually after our emperor passed away, the officials will come together and decide on the posthumous uh, title. So he's given the title of Wu because he is well known for his combats, his military. Okay, Wu is actually the uh, means uh, military in Chinese of fight, combat. So he's called Wu Di obviously for the reason that he's well known for his military campaigns. Okay, he's the one who initiated and spearheaded the campaigns, the military campaigns against the Xiongnu. And other than um, being heavily engaged in war, uh, being engaged in uh, expansion uh, policies, he's also well known for the below uh, matters. He reforms in the ceremonial matters, he encouraged literature and he founded university and encouraged education. Um, but there, were, there are a number of historians who evaluated his uh, achievements and they do conclude that uh, this Xiongnu Wars, the Chinese Xiongnu Wars, are uh, useless, are uh, too expensive, and the resources needed for the war nearly exhausted the people and nearly resulted in another Qin uh, Empire disintegration. People, the, the too much resources were used up, and that depleted the treasury, the state treasury, and the state is in the danger, was in the danger of splitting up at that point of time. So many people view, uh, they had this, they do not view the Sino Shonu war in a favorable light. They disagree and they do not uh, think that this is a, something that he should have done at that time. So, what caused the change in the foreign policy. Mainly it is the fact that time was right. So the Han Empire had been doing nation building, strengthening, self-strengthening. Uh, there were political measures done to, to strengthen the power of the emperor. Um, the power of the emperor is not like how we would have thought where the, the emperor has uh, has an authoritarian rule where he was very powerful and nobody could oppose him. That was not the case. It was the initial phase of the nation building. There were powerful officials. There were uh, powerful empress families who threatened the security of the nation. In fact, during the Gao Zhu's time, uh, after he passed away, his wife was so powerful that his families dominated the court. So there was not, um, Han Empire was not strong enough to deal with external threats. They had to deal with internal threats first. So Han Wudi's time was the time when the Han strengthening came to a peak. So the Han Wudi managed to curb the powers of the other lords. Okay? And he also seized control from his grandmother. Initially, his grandmother was having a lot of control over him. And uh, financial policies, population policies, all that was successful and it resulted in a strong empire at that time. So now it's. Uh, yes? Who is his grandma? No, no Yes. <laughs> yeah, uh, you see, at that point of time, many, there were many occasions when. Um, okay, not, not for Han Wudi, but later on subsequently, uh, there were quite a number of occasions where the emperor passed away and the successor is very young. Yeah, so there are regions. So the regions come in the form of the grandmothers or the mothers themselves. So the, uh, you can see later on in Han Dynasty that they had a lot of problems like that. Uh. But Han Wudi, during his time, he managed to took power from his grandmother, who was the acting region, so called. Okay and he began to exert more influence himself. So now, with all the power in his hands, it means that uh, it is time for Woody to do whatever he wants. Nobody can stop him. And now he turns his attention to the Xiongnu. 
Okay. Turning the attention to the Xiongnu is a natural progression for any nation building, I would think. Why? Because when a nation becomes strong, it is time for them to look outwards to expand. So the campaign against Xiongnu is actually about a campaign of uh, colonization and expansionism. They need to expand beyond their borders to get more lands, get more people, get more resources, accumulate more resources for themselves. That is the that's actually what's happening because the China Empire is strong enough, so now it's time for them to extend their frontiers, get more land, and colonize more areas. Okay, and also it's uh, another very important factor is face. Okay, the national pride because for quite a fair period of time, the Chinese military was not uh, able to deal effectively with the Xiongnu forces. So now it is time for the Han Chinese to step forward, fight, and show that they can be a formidable military strength. So it's it's actually also an act of display of their martial prowess to show that they are quite they, they are good they are good fighting force. How long was this Chinese Xiongnu War, Sino Xiongnu War? It lasted for thirty eight years, and it started after the ambush at Mali. So the battle was on and off, and there was a very major battle in 119 BC. And this is the Battle of Mo Okay, And in this battle, the Xiongnu suffered so much loss that they retreated very deep, further down north. And from that onwards, the Xiongnu became passive. They do not actually lead any uh, aggressive open confrontation against the Han Chinese. They adopted a let's hide with the Chinese policy. That was the turning point, 119 BC. Yes, okay, the Battle of Mo Pei. The Battle of Mo Pei was quite well recorded in the uh, Shi Ji historian records. The depiction of the battle is quite hard to visualize because of the technology they mentioned. It's quite a fair bit of time from now to then that um, it's quite hard to relate to. Uh, basically, it uh, mentioned that uh, there was a force by uh, Wei Qing. Right, Wei Qing, okay? So Wei Qing led a force. He was supposed to attack somebody else. But then he was very sway. He met the Tanri, the ruler okay, of the Xiongnu. So they met and they prepared their formation against each other. So it was said that uh, Wei Qing got his vehicles. I have no idea what the vehicles are like because there was no illustration. He got his vehicles, he parked them in a formation, okay, and then he hide his people within the formation and fired arrows from inside when the Xiongnu people tried to rush in. Then suddenly a mysterious stand sandstorm blew and the uh, Tan Yu's forces panicked and the uh, Wei Qing's forces made use of this advantage, charged at them, defeated them. That was the, the depiction of, of the battle. Okay? And other than Wei Qing being an uh, important key player in general in the success, there was another famous general by the name of Huo Chi Ping. Okay, Huo Chi Ping is known as uh, in uh, English very Garang. Okay, very Karang general, he would lead a small army and ambush, no, and lead a, 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 what do you call it, a surprise attack, okay, into an enemy camp. Usually, uh, there were a few occasions where he had small force defeating a larger force, okay? So these two generals are very well known when it comes to the uh, Xiongnu wars, so they, uh, they have achieved a lot. So what was the outcome? Oh, it was quite a heavy defeat. Okay. Sorry. So yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, it's way too old, uh, uh, Wei Zifu. Uh, Wei Zifu, yes. Wei Zifu is is his uh, sister. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so okay, the Xiongnu lost eighty thousand to ninety thousand men. The Chinese the Chinese lost ten thousand men, but they lost hundred and forty thousand horses. <laughs> so it was heavy horses on the horses. So why such heavy 
uh, house casualties, it was said that the harsh condition and the water contamination led to the uh, death of the horses. Actually, uh, for the Chinese term, horses more valuable than the men. Yeah. So the horses are like... Um, okay, during those days, Calvary is uh, quite a formidable force. Uh, Calvary is like, I don't know what's the good term to use. Maybe in present day, like tank against men, that kind. <laughs> Of, of, of uh, disparity. So in the past, the Chinese used to use chariot warfare and that was in effective against the Xionglu. Xionglu writes on the horses, come fast, go fast. That's the advantage you have if you're using horses. Okay, so with the heavy losses of the horses, the Chinese managed to um, conquer quite a fair bit of land uh, that used to belong to the Xionglu. And with the Chinese forces so powerful, the Xionglu had no choice but to retreat north, further north. Okay. But despite this success, let me bring you to the attention that uh, it's not easy to lead a desert expedition. Okay. Why? Because of the harsh condition. Um, well, for the Chinese, they are definitely not used to the climate there and they still uh, they still keep on to their habits of consuming grain. That's their main food source. So for, um, for a campaign uh, to be effective, uh, yes, to last 100 days. That is the estimation uh, from scholars. Why 100 days? Because that's the number of days you have for you to carry enough food and before the cattle dies. So uh, estimate you need 360 liters of rice. And if I do calculation of 330 ml of Coke can, it's about 1,100 cans. So imagine how much food you need to carry. And you need food for the ox also. 400 liters, the ox eat more food than the soldier. <laughs> so you need to carry, how much is that? 760 liters of food altogether. That's a lot. So the ox tend to die within 100 days carrying that much food. And uh, based on the climate uh, of, of the desert, so that's why it's very difficult for the Han Chinese to go further. Once the Xionglu choose to retreat north, further north, the Chinese had no way to launch an effective campaign against them because of the limitations in terms of this uh, food rationing. Okay? Unless they are brave enough to risk, risk it or bring a large force and finish the campaign in 100 days and come back. But that's very risky. So that's why the Chinese are quite hesitant to advance further. The end of this uh, sino Shonglu War came about after a uh, terrible scandal in 91 BC, which caused scandal, which resulted in the death of the Empress and the overthrow of his heir. And also there were other problems, other than political problems. Uh, China had a drought, sorry, famine and flood during that period of time, so that also seriously affected the uh, Chinese population and some of the uh, capable generals passed away. After these few incidents, the Chinese government could not recover to deal with the Xiongnu and that's the end of the war. Let's have an evaluation of the war. Okay, uh, out of the span of this stretch of war, uh, estimate the Xiongnu loss about 489,500 men, and the Han loss about between 286,000 to 477,000. But you see, the Xiongnu has a smaller population, so relatively speaking, the loss on Xiongnu is heavier, the casualty on Xiongnu is heavier. And if we evaluate the success of the battles, um, we can break this into two halves. The first half and the second half, this time period is used because of the more Bay Battle 119 BC. Eh? Okay, so we use this as a cutoff point eh, to see the impact of the Battle of Mo more Bay. Eh? So the more Mo Bay is this period, eh? this is the later part. If you look at it, uh, let's define the terms first. In Shonu incursions, means that the Xiongnu come and attack you. So the 
Han expedition means the Han is the one who go and attack the Shonen. Okay, so equal number of fights, quite aggressive from the Shonen, launching a lot of attacks. So for the Han forces, 10 victories in comparison to 2 defeats and 2 draws. 2 draws, uh, what's the definition of victory and defeat and draw right over here? Victory in terms of casualty, if I manage to inflict more casualty on the opposing force, is a victory, or another form of victory is capturing land. Okay, draw means I lead my force there, I find nobody to fight. <laughs> that is a draw. <laughs> okay, empty trip. Okay, <laughs> so got two empty trips and two draws. Okay, uh, defeat will be yeah more hand casualties than Shong Mu and uh, the Shong Mu managed to come into the Han borders and wreck the havoc. That is also a, so considered a defeat. Uh. All right. So first half, uh, that means the more of a period, more of a better period as a demarcation, they were more successful in the first half. Okay, second half, you can see less uh, Shonu being more passive now, less attacks, while the Han is still very aggressive. 13 and 14, about the same number of expedi uh, expeditions, but in terms of uh, draws, defeats, victories, about the same, sama sama, 4, 4, 5. 445, like soccer formation 442, uh, 445. Okay, this one 2210. Uh. So what does this mean? Uh? So some uh, so some people would uh, analyze to say that oh this part uh, why so less victory because the hot shipping and uh, uh waiting pass away really. So that's why the without capable generals are uh, the Shonglu, the, sorry, the Han force is not so effective in countering the Shonglu. Actually, not the case. Why? Because for... Uh, I'll come with this later. Not here, never mind. I'll just talk about that. It's not in the slides. Um, for... Okay, for, for the author of the journal article, she analyzed and she felt that it's actually not so much to do with worshipping and uh, raising, passing away. Maybe... Yes, a factor, maybe a small factor, but the main factor is the retreating of the Shonglu further north. Because when the Shonglu decided to retreat away from the Mobe area and go further north, it's very difficult to go out there and engage them because of distance covered. So actually, the Shonglu did something very smart. By retreating to the north, uh, they cease, uh, they tried to stop the number of engagement with the Han forces and preserve their strength. So that was a very effective move for, for the Shonglu. So for the Han, even though they will go out there 14 times, but still not much, not very effective because of the distance covered, the terrain, limitation in the food rationing and all that. Okay. Yeah. And other yeah, so from all these wars, it is a uh, very resulted in great financial burden on the Han Chinese Empire themselves. So where does the money come from? Taxes from the merchant, from the rich people. Okay, and that caused further financial strains for the Chinese Empire. And what's the outcome of this Shino Shonu war? No good. Losses for both sides. Okay. If we are talking about uh, major victories, first half, yes, but the second half no major victories. So let's break down into a few categories and see what is the effectiveness of the Han military campaign. Let's look at all these factors. So if we talk about that the objective of the campaign is to con conquer Shenglu, was it effective? Or was it more to stop Shenglu from attacking the China borders? Or was the objective to end the Hezin? So we look at all this. Let's say these are the objectives. So how much have we encountered? Uh, how much have the Han Chinese accomplished? Okay, to conquer Xiongnu, it failed utterly. It was not effective at all. Because the Xiongnu retreated to the north and they were still there. Okay, they still had a large force. Yes? Oh, it's just a general illustration of a non Chinese tribe. <laughs> <laughs> Generally, this is how we perceive uh, the nomadic tribes to be like. No, no, no particular tribe. Uh. 
but non non Chinese China. Oh, okay. <laughs> Just a generic illustration. No, not any particular person. Eh? <laughs> okay. So, did the Shomu surrender up, uh, during the Shino Shomu War? No, they did not surrender. They just run further north, and they were still active there, still doing well. So uh, the war did not manage to conquer the Shomu. Yes. During the Shomu riot, and the incursions and expeditions, when when the Shomu side incursions into Han territory, right? Are they at the same time as territorial migrants as the Han? No, they are not. They are not. Usually, the like um, their incursions are more of raiding purposes. Go in, they raid, create some havoc, and they go back. They don't. They are not. Their objective is not to occupy land. Yes, the Han, um, there were occasions where it was territorial conquest, but there were also times where they destroyed the base and go back. It is dependent on the uh, stability of the area to set up a base. I will share later the map of some of the areas that are colonized. Okay. Um, so, objective two, the, the war prevented the Shomu from attacking the borders again? No, it did not. Because the Shomu forces are too mobile. They are very mobile. They come and go before you know it. They come, they attack, and they go back. So there's no way to stop the Shomu from attacking the borders. So they still come and attack. Maybe lesser, but they, still, they are still uh, there to attack the cities, the border cities. Financial motivations, is it to end the expensive person? If you are an accountant, you can tell straight away this is not a good move in terms of the losses. If you pay the routine price, it's even cheaper than fighting a war. Okay? Look at the number of horses dead for the hunt forces. So the losses were great for both. If you want to uh, keep peace at the lowest price, routine is even better. It's an even better alternative. So in fact, the officials argued that, oh, this war has done nothing but exhaust our finances without seriously weakening the Shungu power. And is it to preserve the peace and security of China? Uh, actually, in the first place, the Shungu attacked China not to invade China. So, so that's why this issue is not addressed at all. Because the Shungu were not interested in the first place to conquer China. They just come much near to your capital, then they go back. They don't go into your capital. They just want to show you, hey, uh, we are just asking awesome capital. Remember to send us beautiful women and nice suit, then they go back. Okay, so their purpose is just to threaten you, give us, to give us some, some nice stuff, then they go back. They are not keen to occupy land. They are not keen to stay there for long. Okay, so if you want to say that the uh, war is to preserve peace and security, you know, in the first place, the issue wasn't even there. But if you look at it, another perspective, yes, if you are talking about the threat of a Han, sorry, of a Shonen invasion, no issue. The issue is not that. But if you are talking about rebellions, yes. Why? Because I did mention that in the Hertzian Treaty, it was stated that once we enter into a marriage alliance, you are not supposed to help any of my gen generals who are uh, uprising against me. So that helped actually. That helped actually. So does it maintain peace and security? Yes, actually, from this perspective. To show the Chinese military might, yes, definitely has proven itself as a strong force. Okay, this time, Chinese were like the Americans of the modern time, go around attacking people and then showing, hey, we are good at fighting, okay? So yes, did the Chinese do that? Yes, they managed to do that because they managed to defeat the Xiongnu in a more bay battle. So now the Xiongnu look at the Han Chinese as a very powerful Chinese as well as a very powerful military force and you respect that. Uh, very major turning point. Previously, the, when the Xiongnu's have any internal fights, they never asked the Chinese to be their allies. They would, they would not send a letter to the Han Emperor and say, oh, now we are fighting among ourselves. Can you send some forces to help me and fight 
of my those who go against me. Last time, no, but after this, yes, they started to do that. In fact, a lot of um, uh, during a lot of the civil wars, right, the Xiongnu generals and the Xiongnu leaders actually go to the Han government and ask them for military assistance. That's the turning point. So without the, this you know, Xiongnu war, that would not have happened. So for Chinese, the, for the Chinese civilization, it's a proud moment for them. So they no longer see themselves as equal. That's their perspective. Huh? I'm not equal to the Shungu, I'm more superior now than the Shungu that I can fight them in you. So my relationship with you is either you come and submit to me, okay, or you are my enemy. I don't accept you as an equal. This is uh, to answer your question, what are the lands that they gain? Acquired lands. Um, basically they gain Kansu. Present day Kansu. That's the territory that they gain. Huh? Okay, Kansu roughly is Xinjiang that area. Okay, around that area. And they acquired this one, two, three, four, five, five. They acquired these five new commanderies, Jiu Shen, Wu Wei, Long Xi Bei Di, Xi He Jin, these places, and a bit of uh, Mongolia as well. Okay. This is the area that they have gained from expelling the Shungus. Yes? Since they, they lost their territory to the Nuns, but did they build a lost? I mean, since they're nomadic nature. Uh, because they're part of the territory. Yes, but you see the main income, the main source of income for the Shungus is breeding. So if they lose their lands, it's not really a big deal if they can manage to continue to launch successful raiding operations. So in that way, the Shungu civilization, were, they were not really threatened to the brink of disintegration. They were still strong after the shino Shungu war. They are still a formidable force. It's just that they choose not to confront the Han forces directly. So this is actually how far the Han Chinese go. They actually go all the way there, above Mongolia. Russia. Where is this? Russia, right? Yeah. yeah, they actually managed to go all the way there. Um, but this is not occupation of them. They march the troops there, then they go back. Okay? <laughs> they just march the, all the way there, stay there for a few days, and go back. Okay? It's too far away to effectively control those people. So it's still a remarkable feat uh, for them to go all the way so far. It's actually, what is it? Modern day Selenga River, Mongolia and Siberia. Uh, this one is a very big city, Sachi River. And Lake Baikal is one of the largest. It's the biggest lake in the world. Yeah, so it's all the way to Russia. Even beyond Mongolia. Yeah, yeah. Actually, see how strong the Han Chinese is. Uh, to be able to go all the way. Well, actually, they are quite strong uh, at that time. Uh. Do you have an estimate of the population of Han China at that time? Uh, I have the numbers with me, but I cannot remember offhand right now. But I can share with you later on. Yeah. So, a surprising. Uh, What's this? What should I? What word should I use? A surprising twist of event. Yes, is that um, they did not really intend to go to the western regions, as you see, but the retreat of the Shungo actually opened up the opportunities. So the sea, roughly Central Asia, okay, that area, okay. So here the Han forces managed to have um, to establish some foreign relations with the cities here. Can have closer look. This is the uh, Han Empire Siri, this region. Okay, some modern day, around modern day Central Asia. Okay, they established trading relations and all that, but it did not start off as a conscious effort to establish trading relations. How it started was that uh, this 
area here used to be under the Xiongling Fun, so the Han Chinese had no contact with the kingdoms beyond that. Then, after the Xiongu evacuated that area, it became a passage. Okay? And uh, Zhang Qian was sent on a mission before the evacuation. The, the Xiongu forces were still there. Okay, the, there was the, they still had influence in that area. So Zhang Qian was being assigned by the emperor that let's look for some possible allies in the west to fight against the Xiongu. And the um, Han Empire realized that other than raiding from uh, the Chinese Empire, the Xiongu is also raiding from the western regions. So if we could cooperate together and defend ourselves against the Xiongu, that would weaken the Xiongu a lot. Okay, just bear in mind that the Xiongu don't just rob from uh, China, they also rob from the western regions as well. So if they lost a source of income from China, they still can rape the western regions. So that's a concern for Han Wudi and he wanted to work together with the western regions area to see if they can put up an effective resistance against the Xiongu. Okay, so Zhang Qian was sent on a mission to go over but he was a very unlucky person. He oh man, every he go on a mission, he get captured by the Shun. Okay, he get captured, but uh, the good side of it is he get a wife, he got married, and he had some children. Okay, so in terms of establishing the diplomatic ties, he did not really succeed. The, the Western regions empires were not really interested interested to put up a force to resist the Shun. But, however, unexpected uh, findings, unexpected rewards from this journey is that there are lots of valuable things uh, at this region that the Han Empire could uh, tap on the resources. For example, there are very good horses uh, in this place called uh, Taiwan, which is uh, modern day Uzbekistan. It produces fine horses, and the Han Empire were interested to find good horses to replace the 190,000 horses died. <laughs> so they went all the way to uh, Central Asia to get good horses. And they also managed to find grape wine. Okay. Yes, so it became it's a twist of events. We initially wanted to get military alliance, but turned out to be uh, trading partners. Okay. Uh, this is how it happened. The Xiong surrendered, and this piece of land, her sea was evacuated. So, this gave the Han Chinese a very easy access to the Western region for the very first time. So, that access resulted in uh, increased trade, increased contact, increased cultural exchange. In fact, um, Buddhism came into China after this period. Uh, Buddhism was spread, in fact, uh, along the path of the Silk Road. But this path is known as the Silk Road later on. This is what Zhang Qian mentioned to the king, to the emperor, of uh, why he is proposing to establish diplomatic ties with the western region. Okay. If we could use the opportunity to send rich gifts and bribes to the Wushun people and persuade them to move further east and occupy the region which formerly belonged to the Wenye king, then the Han could conclude an alliance of brotherhood with them. And under the circumstances, they will surely do as we say. If we could get them to obey us, it would be like cutting off the right arm of the Xiongnu. And once we had established an alliance with the Wushun, Xia uh, and the other countries to the west we could all be persuaded to come to court and acknowledge themselves our foreign vessels. Again failed, failed to convince but managed to set trading ties instead so commercial exchange of commercial goods. This is not Zhang <laughs> Qian. This cannot be Zhang Qian. This is a this oh, is a uh, representation of an emperor usually. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah this is an emperor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just a generic one. No, no specific. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> 
So the good thing out of the Sino Shongu was is that it opened unexpectedly, not planned, okay? Unexpectedly opened the Western regions to the Han influence, some form of Han influence, but uh, not effective because they were too far to be under effective Han control. It's, uh, it's on and off. Sometimes the Han Chinese would control Western region, sometimes the Shongu would come back and control Western region again. So it's on and off. But at least for the first time, they open up to the Western region. Okay, so we um, have come almost to the end. So let's conclude and round up everything. The war and the conflict between the Shonu and the Han is a recurrent one that's happening throughout the rest of the world also. Even in Europe, the Romans were actually fighting against so-called the barbarian tribes. Okay? Yes, so this in general is actually a, a clash between the nomadic and the agrarian civilization. So in fact, this clash will happen again and again and again in China's history. The Chinese people will be seen fighting the northern barbarians in subsequent Chinese dynasties, especially the Song dynasty, where you have the Liao first, then you have the Jin, then you have the Mongolians coming from the north. Okay, and then for the last dynasty, the Qing dynasty, the Manchurians, they are also nomadic tribes from the north, they managed to come down, attack China, took over from the Ming dynasty, and established a new uh, empire. So this is a recurrent pattern from the history of uh, China in general. And uh, the relations between these two civilizations is a tricky one. We have seen that direct military confrontation is not very effective. So it is, um, it is up to the ingenuity of the subsequent rulers of how to establish, how to use diplomatic means to secure the security of their borders. For example, for the Tang dynasty later on, what they do is they make sure that the tribes fight against each other so they don't come and fight us. <laughs> That's a very clever way. Okay. And uh, subsequently for the Han Chinese, that's what they did also, which we will cover in the second part. They get the Shungus to fight the Shungus. Or they get the Wu Shun to fight the Shungus. Okay. Yeah. So um, in general the Chinese civilization would not um, take it lying to claim themselves equal to the Shungu or the nomadic uh, or the northern neighbors for long. If they ever do that, it is a form of political means to stabilize their internal politics first. And when the time is right, they will hit back. Okay. Uh, conclusion about the war, Sino Shungu War is controversial. You could say that they should have fought or they should not have fought because you can you have arguments on both sides. But why they should not have fought because it was expensive. But the good thing is that they elevated the status of the Chinese Empire to be the big brother of that region. And they have done that. Um, the countries, the kingdoms in the western region, they would send uh, and, uh, and uh, they will send missions over to the Chinese government and say, oh, we, somebody is attacking us, can you come and help us fight off these forces? So they are like America, like they are peacemaker <laughs> at that time. Uh. <laughs> Any any people, any countries fighting, they will come in and say, hey, don't fight. If you want to fight, I come and I will come over and fight you. <laughs> uh, so pretty effective uh, at the point of time in maintaining the security in the Western region area. And then the other good thing that comes out of it is the opening of the opening up of the Silk Road. So whether they should have fought this war, it is at the end of the day it's up to you to think about it as the good side to it and the downside to it. But to me, if you ask me, yes, they, they should have fought that war. To me, uh, even though it is expensive, but the key uh, success to it is knowing when to stop. So they stop at the right time. If they have continued further, then that will be disastrous 
for for the Chinese Empire. That's the end of the talk. I hope you enjoy the talk. So thank you. Thank you so much.